For real. All right, so this is second semester review. See if I can do it in 15 minutes. So remember, we started the semester saying that there's two kinds of charge. There's positive and negative, although we didn't have names for them at the time. And we did this sticky tape lab, and in the lab we realized that uh, when you charged up pieces of sticky tape, they attracted each other. So this new electric force that we didn't understand had to do with distance. And the farther away two pieces of tape were, the weaker the force. And so we knew it had to do with force. Well, we later saw that the actual equation, which is called Coulomb's Law, which we didn't do any math with, but we at least wanted to see it, is that the force between two charges depends on charge 1 and charge 2 and the distance between them squared. Because the distance was squared, a lot of times this is referred to as an inverse square law. And there's lots of things in nature that obey inverse square laws besides Coulomb's law. Uh, we also learned that charge is measured in a unit called Coulombs, which we didn't do a whole lot with either, but you'll see that from time to time. We learned a couple points like you don't create charge and you don't destroy it, but you simply transfer it around. And we also learned through doing the sticky tape lab and others that when you transfer it around, it's only the electrons that do the moving. And remember our model for the atom was that you have a nucleus made of protons and then some neutrons in there. And then going around the outside here, we had some electrons. And the protons can't move because they're locked in the nucleus with the strong force. Electrons can move some depending on what kind of material it is. We learned um, right away that if it was foil, uh, then it acted differently than the paper did. Because foil was a conductor which holds its electrons loosely so they're able to move easily, and whereas a paper is an insulator, which holds the electrons tightly and they're not able to move uh, so easily. So whenever things become charged, as we said down here, it's because either electrons jumped onto it, which would make it negative, or electrons jumped off of it, which would make it positive. So those were the uh, ways for that. Now for insulators, we had uh, two ways to charge insulators. We had a way to charge them directly, uh, which was uh, scraping or friction. And remember with scraping or friction, that was when you force electrons onto or off of something. So that was like the balloon in your hair. All right, so there's your hair. Uh, and electrons were scraped onto the balloon from your hair and so there was way more electrons and protons, so it was negatively charged. The other way to charge an insulator was polarization. Polarization was what we did when we took a negatively charged balloon and we made it stick to a neutral ceiling. And remember, if we look at the, electron or the atoms in the ceiling, those electrons couldn't move very far, but at least they could move to the far side of each atom and that made the protons a little bit closer so the electric force told us that the attraction would be a little bit stronger than the repulsion because those negatives are a little farther away but that's as far away as they could get we also did the uh, water stream being bent by a balloon and also uh, the board being spun around by the balloon once we had done uh, charges we started moving into electric fields Remember, those are the changed space around a charge. And you can imagine a charge and then somehow the space has been changed. They invented that idea because they didn't like the, the thought that two positives could somehow interact with each other without ever touching. So they said, let's get rid of the idea and just make up something new that this first charge changes the space around it. We'll call it a field an electric field in this case, and the second charge is touching the electric field, so it feels a force. And we had ways of representing electric fields. We said, let's draw lines that represent the force 
that a positive test charge would feel. And we had several different configurations for that. The spacing meant how strong it was. The arrows told you what direction the force would be in. So if you had two charges, something like this, you would get field lines that kind of bend around like that. And then we had others that we learned how to draw as well. Um, why did we care about that? Well, mainly because electric fields store energy. We saw that with capacitors and the Leyden jar, that when you separated charges and put like positives on one side on a plate, negatives on the other, that it created a strong electric field that could store energy for a long time if you needed it to. So that brought up this idea of uh, total energy versus average energy. And we said if we push a charge in um, a certain distance and it takes 10 joules of energy to do it, let's pretend it's one coulomb of charge. And I like the game so much I repeat it. And now there are two charges there for a total of 20 joules. Now there are three charges there for a total of 30, uh, 30 joules. So the total was the electric potential energy. And that would be measured in joules, in this case, 30 joules. But even though I had three charges in there, I still had the same amount of average energy per charge as when I had one. So the average potential energy per charge was 30 joules total, but divided by three coulombs of charge was 10 joules per coulomb, which we made up a new unit for and we called it the volt. So typically this is called voltage because it's measured in volts. Another name for the uh, voltage is also electric potential. I tend to avoid that term just because it's confusing electric potential with electric potential energy. But the key idea is one's a total measured in joules, one is an average measured in volts. Why did we care about that? Well, we cared about that because charges want to move from high volts to low volts. Or another way to say that is charges would move from a high electric potential to a low electric potential. So it's a different way of thinking about it than electric fields. Electric fields dealt with force, um, and voltage deals with energy. Okay, a good example here, I'll go to a different page, um, <clears throat> was we, we did an example at one point about a spark from a sparkler. And we said, why doesn't a sparkler burn you because a spark from it? That's like a thousand degrees Celsius. And that would be hot enough to burn. Well, the idea was it had a high average. That was its average kinetic energy. But it had a low total energy. There weren't very many molecules in that spark. So there was a low total energy, but a high energy. Just like when we had the Van de Graaff generator out, and you guys were able to touch it, even though it had over 100,000 volts of energy per charge. A very high average energy, a high volts, but it didn't have very many charges. There were only a small number of electrons that actually transferred to your body. So it had a low total energy just like the spark from the sparkler. Okay, once we understood voltage uh, okay, we then started talking about resistance. And we said resistance is the idea that, that there will be an opposition to charge movement, that not everything wants charges to go marching through it. And we said we could measure resistance in ohms. And the unit for an ohm is the Greek symbol omega, which looks kind of like a horseshoe. And we did several ranking tasks about, well, what actually affects the amount of resistance? And we said, if you have a longer wire, you'll have more resistance. Uh, if you have a skinnier wire, you'll have more resistance. If it's made of a different material, you'll have more resistance. 
and if it has a higher temperature you'll also have more resistance so those physical things affect the amount of resistance uh, that's in a wire we then compared how much voltage and how much resistance a wire can have and we came up with a graph here and we said let's take current I for current V for voltage and we saw in the lab that as you made the voltage bigger it made the current go bigger so current was directly proportional to voltage we also saw that as you made the resistance bigger the current got smaller so current was inversely proportional to resistance if I take those ideas and put them together I can write an equation as long as the units work out and the equation is I equals VR which we call Ohm's law it doesn't work for everything but it is a good approximation for most things that we do so once again this was current this was voltage and this was resistance we've talked about units for all of them except for current so the unit for current was the ampere which we usually call amps and capital A uh, was what we did for that okay we then got into saying uh, well there's two different ways for current to move the charges can keep moving in the same direction slowly and we'll call that direct current or DC or a charge could just keep changing direction the whole time and that would be alternating current which we call AC so AC is what we use in outlets and buildings and houses DC is what you get in batteries we also had power few formula for power which was the current times the voltage we used that when we uh, figured out um, <clears throat> how much it cost to run different appliances we then looked at series versus parallel and the, d the idea of series was you have one pathway and the idea of parallel is you had more than one pathway multiple pathways in series you have the same current through everything in parallel you had possibly different currents but they add to total so each current added up through each branch adds to the total in series they share the voltage so they could have different voltages but they add to the total voltage from the battery uh, what did I not do in parallel they have the total voltage they each get the full same volts when things are in series they end up having more resistance because it's like one resistor right after another when they're in parallel they have less resistance because it's now it has more pathways so it's like a wider wire easier to do okay we then get into uh, magnetism we said that the source of all magnetism one model is the source is moving charges and if you think of an electron spinning around its axis that makes up a moving charge so you can think of that being a little micromagnet with a north and south pole and if all of these spinning electrons are in the same direction we could say that's a domain and that domain has a direction at points and if all the domains line up then it's magnetic uh, we said there's three categories of things it could be a magnet it could be magnetic or a better term for that was ferromagnetic meaning it has iron in it so it can stick to a magnet or it is a magnet or a magnet doesn't affect it at all so the model was you can't these uh, micromagnets all cancel out or they can't be aligned these do not cancel out and they can be aligned and same for a magnet we looked at the jumping wire effect which is how you create an electric uh, or an electromagnet you take a wire hook it up to a battery and um, it becomes an electromagnet stick a chunk of iron in there it becomes stronger stick another magnet or loop of wire next to it no sorry stick a real magnet next to it and this will jump because it'll be attracted or repelled so that can make speakers motors and meters we then talked about Faraday's law is that my time I'm close 
With Faraday's law, it was take a coil of wire, move a magnet next to it, and you can light up a light bulb without having a battery. We talked about how transformers, uh, well, this is the idea of a generator, I should say, move a coil of wire next to a magnet. A transformer steps up or steps down the voltage, and you have to use alternating current to do that, and the trade-off is it steps up or down the current in the opposite direction. We learned electromagnetic waves are regions of electric and magnetic fields that are changing with the magnetic coming out of the page and into the page, the electric going up and down. You can't possibly draw that fast enough. And so that's pretty much uh, it. If I take one minute and talk about the sound and light stuff, we have frequency of a sound wave which corresponds to the pitch. Frequency of a light wave corresponds to the color. They both can use this formula, frequency times wavelength is the velocity. They both can use the idea that frequency is 1 over the period. Frequency is how often uh, waves are coming in per second, measured in hertz, cycles per second. Period is the amount of time it takes for one cycle. It's going to be measured in seconds. Doppler effect was that apparent shift when something is moving, so the frequency is higher on this side and lower on this side, so that'll be a change in pitch if it's a noise. That'll be a change in color if it's light. Today we talked about the spectrum, radio waves, microwaves, uh, visible, infrared, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray, how we can only see this narrow band. We talked about how when a wave bounces off something, we call it reflection, and when it bends as it goes into something, we call it refraction. And there you go. That was 17 minutes. I didn't make it. <laughs>